Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. I am Iasiri Oluwa Shunsira. I am the coordinator of the group, and I'll be the host for today's meeting. I am an associate professor at the Department of Animal Physiology, Federal University of Agriculture, Abia Kutago State, Nigeria. But currently, I'm on the George Foster Fel uh, Research Fellow at the Humboldt University to Berlin. So I'm happy to welcome you to the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. And uh, I will briefly inform you about how the group was uh, formed and what our missions are. In the year 2019, there was a gathering you know, uh, of students and researchers because of the need to establish an animal welfare network group in Nigeria. So we had our first meeting in 2019, and that was how we kickstarted this group. And the missions of the group are, number one, to increase awareness in animal behavior and welfare in Nigeria, Africa, and the world at large. And secondly, is to foster collaboration and networking among researchers who are in the field of animal behavior and welfare. Our third mission is to educate the public on the importance of animal welfare. Uh, we meet every first and third Wednesdays where we discuss issues related to animal behavior and welfare. And we also have uh, programs like webinars, example of what we are having today, and also we do programs which we call the uh, virtual inaugural lectures where we invite senior professors in this field to come you know lecture us based on their wealth of experience and um, we this group the animal welfare group nigeria is on different social media platforms so we we'll appreciate it if you can kindly follow us and uh, you know encourage us and give us feedback so we are on facebook we are on x but our X handle is at AWGN14. And we are on LinkedIn. And also we have our YouTube channel where our webinars, all our meetings are recorded. And on this YouTube channel, we tend to upload those videos because we think this is an inestimable, valuable uh, resource for other people, probably those that miss the programs or whoever want to go back to have a rewatch of the program and also learn. And also I would like to encourage us because animal welfare is, uh, you know, just um, imagine in some areas and you may be short of ideas or you may not even really understand what it entails. But if you uh, find, your, find yourself uh, to our YouTube channel, you know, you have a lot of presentations that we have uploaded. You can just watch and relax and enjoy. And from there, you gain insights and understanding about what animal behavior and welfare actually is. And also, you can use this as an educational resource where you can even invite your students, you know, you can pick a topic there, you know, watch it with your students, and this can trigger the discussion, you know, in, in the classroom. So I think this is a very valuable resource that we need you can make good use of. So today I'm excited about today's presentation uh, on the importance of sleep for animal welfare because sleep behavior kind of seems to be something that uh, we don't really focus on. Uh, but you know, every, every living thing, I believe, sleeps at one time or the other. So we need to know how important it is, how important sleep is for animal behavior. And to deliver this presentation today is uh, Dr. Linda Greening, Greening from the Hot Puri University, uh, United Kingdom. And today's uh, moderator for today's program is Oyeniro Victor. So thank you so much. I'll hand over to the moderator to give us the rules and then we continue with the presentation. Thank you and you're welcome. Thank you very much for that um, wonderful um presentation, Dr. Yashere. Um, my name is Victor Inira from the University of Arkansas. I'm going to be uh, moderating this section, and I would like to welcome each and every one of us to this wonderful webinar um, series of the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria, joining us from everywhere in the world. You're welcome. Today's the second for the series for the year 2024. Um, our speaker for today is Dr. Linda Greeny. Um, Let me just give us a brief um overview of Dr. Linda Greeny, who is going to be presenting on the importance of sleep for animal welfare. Dr. Um, Linda Greeny graduated with a bachelor's honors in equine science in 2003 and completed a master's in the same topic in 2006. She has lectured in the field of um, 
behavior and welfare at Artspore since 2006 and currently leads on equality, diversity and inclusivity as the head of inclusivity from 2013 to 2017. Dr. Linda L. Lee's role on the International Society for Equitation Science Council and currently chairs the Equity, Diversity, Inclusivity and Accessibility Committee for the International Society for Applied Ontology. A principal research topic area is equine behavior and welfare with particular interest in the fields of equine stereotypic behavior. And more recently, equine sleep and nocturnal behavior. She recently defended a PhD thesis titled Applied Quantification of Equine Sleep Behavior and Environmental Factors Affecting Its occur Occurrence, which I'm going to be dropping the link in um, the chat box. If you have any questions from um, Dr. Lin for, for Dr. Linda, feel free to actually drop it in the chat box. And then why hand over to Dr. Linda to go over our presentation. Over to you, Dr. Linda. Thank you so much for that introduction, Victor. And thank you so much for the invitation to talk today at the Animal Welfare um, Group Nigeria. This is um, an area of um, extreme interest for me specifically. Um, I've been researching equine sleep for the last 10 years, and I thought it would be nice to provide an overview of, of what sleep is to begin with, and then start to delve into kind of the welfare aspects of what that is, what that means for animals um, through a comparative uh, exercise. So we'll start off, and um, the first thing to think about then really is fundamentally is a behavior. It's a behavioral state, and we can describe it through loss of locomotion, uh, maintaining a distinct posture, um, a prefer preference for specific environmental locations. There's a homeostatic rebound to sleep deprivation. So with increasing pressure to sleep, there will be increasing sleep-like behavior. Enhanced arousal thresholds to environmental stimuli and uh, rapid reversibility. So this makes it um, um, a state of unconsciousness different to an anesthesia and um, coma and topal um, because it is rapidly reversible and um, but there are arouse, uh, enhanced arousal thresholds which means that they will sleep animals can sleep um, in, in in different um, environments and in different ways and on the right hand side here then um, we have two um, behavioral states uh, waking and sleep across the x-axis um, we can have an active state or a quiet state. And when we're talking about sleep today, we'll be talking about quiet sleep where an animal is relaxed and immobile and the state itself is, is readily reversible. And <clears throat> sleep itself is a dynamic process, which means that it is controlled by circadian rhythms. So those daily rhythms linked into light and dark cycles, but it is also under homeostatic control. So there is an increasing pressure to sleep the, the longer an individual stays awake. And we can see on the right hand side here some wiggly lines. These are brainwave activity as measured by electroencephalography, so EEG equipment. And these are surface electrodes that are attached um, at various places around the, the cranium that enable us to um, measure what the brain is doing at any particular time. And during sleep, there are some. Um, characteristic patterns linked into these different stages and phases of sleep. So at the top, we can see brainwave activity that indicates the uh, individual is awake. Um, with horses, particularly, you see um, a state of drowsiness, which is kind of transient between wakefulness and sleep. Um, that might be depicted here by those alpha waves where the eyes are closed and the animal is relaxed. Um, and we have two particular sleep states. We have a, a state of non-rapid eye movement sleep and a state of rapid eye movement sleep. The stages that we have here are to do with non-rapid eye movement sleep. And it um, determines, or these, these different stages show how an animal becomes increasingly deeper in sleep, if you like. So down in stage three and four, where delta waves are appearing, we know that an animal is very deeply asleep um, in those stages. Um, following on, um, there is also that rapid eye movement sleep state, which I'll talk about in the next slide ever so quickly. Uh, and we'll also look at how these states and stages appear um, in terms of a sleep cycle. Um, particularly, we'll look at 
humans and horses today. And just to, to re, reconfirm, this is um, a state of unconsciousness that is different to anesthesia, coma, or torpor, or hibernation, um, because it is rapidly reversible. So it's within the animal's control. And we know that a state of unconsciousness renders an animal particularly vulnerable to predation. So it's important to think about prey versus predator species um, and the differences that you see in sleep states there based on their evolutionary kind of um, biology. Okay, so rapid eye movement sleep um, is um, a lighter stage of sleep. And it is essential that an animal achieves rapid eye movement sleep at some point. Because during rapid eye movement sleep, um, there is muscle atonia, so relative paralysis. And in order to achieve that, an animal has to be in a recumbent position. So the animal has to be lying down. Because if the animal achieves REM sleep whilst it's standing, the muscle um, tone will be lost and it will fall over. Um, and we see examples of that actually, um, where there is REM sleep deprivation, but because of the homeostatic rebound, the pressure to sleep is so great that the animal will achieve REM sleep while standing. Um, and that's very much linked in with um, spontaneous collapse. The diagram that we see here in front of us on the left-hand side, this pink blob, I think is the brain. We have the spinal cord and we have muscles and the, the lines above, we've got electroencephalography at the top. So brainwave activity, and we have electromyography on the bottom line here, which is muscle activity. So sometimes REM sleep is particularly difficult to determine or to detect from electroencephalography. The brainwave activity mirrors other stages of sleep and or wakefulness, but you can definitely confirm REM sleep is achieved using electromyography because you will see relative muscle quiescence because there is a loss of voluntary muscle activity during this stage of sleep. Okay, so hopefully that's a nice introduction to the different stages of sleep and the two main states. Now sleep occurs for a number of different reasons. Oops, sorry, I've gone too far. Here are just some of the functions that we have um, determined relative to sleep, although the true functionality of sleep is still being discussed in the science. So we know that there's a restorative function, that during sleep, the body repairs itself and produces proteins. Um, we also know that um, there is uh, sorry, brain plaque removal that occurs during sleep, which is particularly important um, for certain uh, neural uh, conditions. Um, we also know about um, energy conservation being a, a major factor of sleep. So the animal is using far less energy when it is sleeping than it is during um, active wakefulness. We know that um, during sleep, there is an immune function regulation. Um, so promotion of um, immunocompetence. There's a lot of memory consolidation that occurs during sleep as well. So committing short-term memory into long-term memory within the hippocampus. Um, and there's also um, opportunities to forge new uh, neural pathways. So thinking about brain plasticity and that, that learning um, element. So what we can think about is that this reduced responsiveness to potentially threatening stimuli during sleep represents a significant danger to survival. And that's across all animals um, where you've got reduced respons res responsiveness, which renders you particularly vulnerable in any given situation. But the fact that all animals sleep strongly argues in favor of an adaptive role of sleep in increasing the overall fitness of an organism. So we have evidence across a range of species from insects through to large mammals, um, highlighting how a, a sleep state occurs, indicating the importance of sleep and that rest function, and potentially some of these functions that we, we see on the slide in front of us. So we can have a look at the differences now that occur between mammalian species specifically for this talk. And this table highlights, um, what's that, six, seven different species and ourselves included in there, um, showing the different occurrences of sleep uh, between daylight and nighttime, so the dark period, light and dark cycles. And 
Uh, this is developed from um, authors such as Campbell and Tobler, uh, Kaskadon and Dement, um, Callas uh, and Tobler and, and Schwerin and, and Wang et al. Um, and you can find all of those authors and a little bit more about this table if you scan the uh, code on the screen here, it will take you through to our review article. So the dark segments on this table indicate periods of sleep. And if we take ourselves at the top, you can see that we achieve around 33% of a 24 hour period in sleep. And that usually occurs in the dark period. And that makes us monophasic sleepers. There are cultures which engage in um, afternoon napping and daytime sleeping, which I really advocate for. It's a great idea. Um, so then we would talk about ourselves maybe as monophasic or biphasic species. But the majority of animals are polyphasic sleepers. That is, they will be sleeping at various times during the day. So the white segments indicate wakefulness and the light gray segments suggest that they might be sleeping at that time. And on the right hand side of this table, you can see the percentage breakdown of, of what the animals, how much sleep inside of a 24 hour period, how much time within a 24 hour period is, is dedicated to sleep. And horses, cows feature particularly low in this hierarchy. And we generally recognize that's because as a prey species, it doesn't make much sense to spend a lot of time unconscious. But the fact that they sleep less doesn't make that sleep any less important. So they have evolved or they have adapted to survive on 17% of a 24 hour period dedicated to sleep. And it means that it's very important that they still achieve that 17% on average. Um, and they can do that opportunistically. So wherever there is an opportunity where they are safe, and they're comfortable, and there are no competing priorities, they will achieve sleep but they only need 17%, well, on average, achieve 17%. And that's in comparison to things like a dog as a, a predator, um, who then they sleep multiple times, definitely polyphasic throughout the day. The mouse here is a, an example of a nocturnal species. So we see most of the sleep occurring during the daytime. Um, and then we have um, uh, a monkey there at the top. And in actual fact, you know, we are on average supposed to sleep between seven and eight hours per night. That's the average, I think, which has dropped over time. So um, much as we on average achieve 33% sleep, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the optimal for us. Um, we're all driven by different social um, and industrial, I guess, pressures um, in terms of how we um, use our time. It's really important that we give over time to sleep um, and pay that some, um, uh, uh, consider that as, as quite significant for our own well being, so that we might then also consider it as important for the well being of our animals. Okay. So we've talked about polyphasic sleepers, we've talked about evolutionary kind of pressures, um, we've talked about different stages of sleep, and now we can see those different stages of sleep here in this graph. So this is called a hypnogram. And it enables us to see when different stages of sleep are occurring. This is an, a young adult human. Um, point zero uh, would be the person is awake um, through to the point where they are falling into sleep. So within the first hour, and then we get up to our eight hour quotient of sleep for, for on average a young adult. And we can see that we go from wakefulness into stage one, two, three, four, and then we cycle back through those non-REM sleep stages to rapid eye movement sleep and cycle back down into one, two, three, um, non-REM sleep and back up, et cetera. And at any one point for REM sleep, you may or may not wake up and you may know that you've woken up or it may be a subconscious wake up. And it's suggested that rapid eye movement sleep enables us to prepare ourselves for waking um, and is also a transient um, period where we can work out whether our environment enables us, is safe enough to return to sleep again. So it's quite natural to see a period of wakefulness after rapid eye movement sleep, but it's less normal to see an interruption in sleep or wakefulness um, occurring uh, within um, non-rapid eye movement sleep. And we'll talk about that relative to sleep quality uh, a little bit later on. 
Another characteristic of human sleep is that towards the um, actual waking period, so up to um, maybe eight hours, we start to see those rapid eye movement sleep periods increasing. So more deep sleep during the earlier stages of the night for a human and lighter sleep in terms of rapid eye movement sleep increasing um, in the earlier hours of the morning. And you can see also that rapid eye movement it, it was almost like a cycle from wakefulness through to the end of rapid eye movement sleep would be one cycle. And then from the start of um, stage one, maybe through to the end of rapid eye movement sleep, again, would be another cycle. And we can see maybe four to five cycles of sleep in a young adult um, as a normal. That would be our normal distinct pattern of sleep for a human, for a young adult specifically. When we compare that to uh, an elderly adult, we can see that they achieve less deep sleep on average um, and that there is a lot more kind of wakefulness or what we might suggest is sleep interruptions, like fragmentation of sleep occurring during the night. And an elderly person, um, in terms of these sleep fragmentations, might start reporting poor quality sleep. So if they are waking during these transient periods of wakefulness, then that can be quite disrupting um, and can affect their subjective perception of sleep quality. So they may be achieving um, a good amount of sleep. It's just that it's interrupted, which reduces. And we can think about that um, in a little bit more detail and start to think about that relative to the difference between fragmentation and deprivation. So this beautiful graph here, we can see that we've got sleep and wake cycles along the x-axis. And process C talks to us of circadian control. So decreasing pressure to sleep during dark hours, increasing pressure to sleep um, as we get into uh, wakefulness. Um, and that's all linked in with our light dark cycles and the secretion of melatonin. The process C is our homeostatic um, pressure to sleep. And this talks about um, increasing motivation to sleep with increasing sleep pressure. And that's indicated by the line in the middle of the graph here. So we start to see increasing pressure to sleep um, as we start to see um, process C decreasing here. And um, we're going into potentially a um, state of um, sleep. Within this first bit of the sleep cycle, We've talked about fragmentation and how um, an individual can wake up. Um, and that can be conscious or it can be subconscious or it can be very small micro arousals that are only detectable within um, electroencephalography. And there's a lot of um, work going on to discover um, whether that does or doesn't have an impact on an individual. The red line is where sleep does not occur. So much as there is an increasing pressure to sleep, the individual is prevented from engaging in sleep. So that sleep pressure massively increases up to the point where it's able to sleep. And then we see rapid uh, decrease in, um, in the uh, pressure lines there. Um, and deprivation is linked through to all kinds of issues through to where it was possible uh, with seminal work in the 70s, um, fatality. Uh, specifically in, in rodent species. So we understand that chronic sleep deprivation can have significant physiological effects. What we don't understand is how deprivation and fragmentation necessarily um, compare, but we can talk about that in just a minute. The first thing I'm going to show you, hopefully, here, once the video kind of wakes up, is a horse in its stable. It's the first disclaimer. A lot of my videos, all of them, are about horses. So here is Storm. Storm, in this video, hopefully, come on video, is asleep. We describe this as a state of standing sleep. So the pole, the bit between the ears, is equal to the height of the withers, which is kind of the highest point of the base of the neck. And we see no ear movement or eye movement, but then here, the animal is awake. There's voluntary movement of muscles there. There's licking and chewing, there's stretching. And he's readjusting his position. And he's having a little think about the world in general. <laughs> and as he readjusts himself, there's one eye blink 
and then he's back asleep again. And we talk about that, we describe that as a good example of a, a sleep interruption. Okay. So here is an attempt at describing the effects of deprivation versus fragmentation. And it's a study using rodents and cortisol concentrations. Oops. So we know that cortisol concentrations are, are used as a stress measurement because we know that um, with con chronic exposure to a stressor, we see increasing secretion of cortisol. So in the cage control, the animals were left alone, and this is their baseline cortisol concentration, which was significantly different to all three other um, conditions. The first condition was exercise, and we know cortisol increases in response to exercise naturally, so we might suggest that this is um, a natural increase um, and what we would expect to see in terms of normal um, exercise related increases in cortisol. But uh, what was interesting was that there was an increase in cortisol associated with um, animals that experienced sleep fragmentation. So they were disrupted or interrupted during the night. And a further increase in cortisol was observed with sleep deprivation. So uh, suggesting that cortisol linked to stress suggests that um, stress and sleep are interlinked and you can increase stress, a stress response by depriving an animal of sleep or by interrupting its sleep. Try to depict it um, in the following diagram here, thinking about um, the interrelationship. So we have reductions in sleep, which as we've just seen in the previous slide, result in increases in stress and or cortisol concentration. But at the same time, we also recognize that in actual fact, increases in stress and cortisol can also result in a reduction in sleep. And we'll explore that in just a little bit more detail um, in the second half of the um, presentation. So I'm just stopping here to see if anybody has any questions. And Samuel, I can see in the chat that you've asked, under what condition is sleep not a good behavior? Well, that is a very, <laughs> a very good question. Um, we might talk about uh, diseases linked in with, um, for example, narcolepsy is a condition. We don't see narcolepsy in horses. I haven't looked into other species, to be honest with you, but that is, um, uh, is kind of linked into sleep, and that's inappropriate sleep occurring at that sleep occurring, sorry, sleep occurring at inappropriate times. Um, but I guess it, it depends what appropriate um, or what good good is in a situation. If an animal is sleeping, then it generally means it needs to, which is a good thing. <laughs> but it might be that it conflicts with the role that the animal is, is supposed to be undertaking at that time. So I have seen videos of people going into horses stables and the horse is um, fast asleep and they'll be trying to wake the animal up because they've gone in with the tack ready to try and ride that animal. And we talk about, you know, conflict in um, expectation. The animal expects to sleep in its stable and, and there is homeostatic pressures and physiological processes enabling it to do so, but the human has other ideas about that particular situation. So that might be helpful, it might not be. Um, I can't see any other questions, so I will continue. The second half, we're gonna start thinking a little bit more about welfare and the relationship between sleep and welfare, because hopefully I've given a good overview of where we are with sleep currently. So. There's a whole host of definitions of welfare out there, and I've tried to cherry pick them into a concept that students and I discuss, which is around animal experience. So animals experience an environment and the environment can involve positive and negative factors. And that can have positive and negative influences on the animal who can perceive it either positively or negatively. And it's those perceptions, it's those feelings that come into the welfare state. We can also think about how those um, experiences then 
impact upon the mental and physical health of the animal. So if the animal, for example, in sleep, if the animal is not achieving um, appropriate amounts of sleep, then we might suggest that it has low mood, because I don't know about you, but after poor sleep, I am, I'm not all sunshine and rainbows, that's for sure. And we started to look a little bit of, about that in horses as well, using judgment bias testing um, relative to sleep disruption or, or and we found some trends which we suggest would indicate horses are, do experience lower mood after a poor night's sleep. Um, and so that poor experience might impact on that horse's mental capability in terms of training and learning, or it might it actually impact on its physical ability um, in terms of muscle firing and um, timeliness in terms of um, uh, taking cues from its rider, for example, and you, you might see it tripping or stumbling a little bit more as well. We know that welfare is not something that we give to animals. And we also know that welfare in, involves concepts such as sentience. So that level of self-awareness and ability to feel, which we, we measure in terms of affective state. And we think about it in levels of high or low arousal. And we can talk about it in terms of stress. So we know that, therefore, factors in the environment are things that, horse, that animals sorry, either like or don't like. And they have feeling about, feelings about those things in terms of how they are affected by them. So their experience in the environment is not just robotic and it's not just a reflex response. And a lot of people talk about pain as a reflex response but that is um, a misjudgment in terms of pain as a, an emotional state versus nociception, which is that um, tactile and mechanical kind of um, central nervous system response. Yeah. Stressful situations are important and they occur in a free living environment. You can't get away from them. They're really important, actually, in terms of um, providing challenge, opportunity to learn and adapt. But where adaptation isn't possible, so where the animal isn't able to learn about the environment and adjust itself appropriately, it has to try and find a way to cope in that environment. And the diversion of resources to enable that cope, coping mechanism over time can have very negative impacts on the animal. So we started to think about that relative to sleep. And here, another quick plug for the review paper with a scan code there we can start to talk about it again. So on the left-hand side, we know environmental factors um, in the horse's stable, for example, that can have an effect on um, reduced welfare. So if the animal runs out of forage and is left without forage for a long period of time, it has to optimize its gastrointestinal system through constant gut fill. Um, and so having that empty period physiologically and mentally can affect the animal. Um, and that can factors into physical and psychological stresses as well. Both of those things can increase stress and reduce the welfare state. And in turn, that can reduce sleep. So where we have competing priorities, for example, the animals looking around for forage and waiting for forage, um, that's the priority over sleep. Um, we also know, though, that environmental factors can affect how an animal sleeps. Um, for example, we've looked at um, bedding conditions where a horse in its stable on a thinner bed will sleep um, less kind of than an animal with a thicker bed. So you get reductions in sleep because of environmental factors and um, where an animal, maybe for example, horses, uh, but other animals, I guess, maybe they're isolated. That might be quite stressful for the animal because they're vigilant in a novel environment. And that might also compete with the need to sleep, so you see reduced sleep there as well. And that reduction in sleep we've talked about can have a massive impact physiologically that can then lead to increased stress and reduced welfare. So it's a, a really complex pattern, or a really complex relationship, sorry, between these, these two things, sleep and welfare. There was um, a super good uh, meta-analysis conducted by Kate et al recently and they were looking at rodents in laboratories, talking about conventionally housed rodents, so the cage on the left-hand side here, versus a, an enhanced or an enriched house on the, on the right-hand side. 
and they found through their meta-analysis hundreds of papers that your conventionally housed rodents are behaviorally frustrated and that they're at risk of pessimism abnormal behavior and impaired sleep and they show lower levels of resilience so they're consistently more vulnerable to mental and physical health problems so they become sicker when they're diseased and they die sooner than their enhanced housing counterparts and the authors recommended that really conventional housing should therefore be treated as a stressful procedure and a stressful procedure in the US is defined as something which causes moderate discomfort or stress and a procedure and in, in Europe procedures that have caused moderate impairment of the well-being or general condition of the animals is also known as a stressful procedure. So when we start to think about how we manage our animals in all their different environments and all their different roles, one of the things that we want to avoid is a conventional housing situation that can affect the animal in this way. So that we know we're not causing the animal stress through a lack of ability to engage in normal behavior, including sleep. And these findings mean that potentially the results from, from medical studies are only applicable uh, to humans that are in the same stressful environments. So if we're seeing a drug works on a rat that has been kept in the page on the left, it may not work as well as um, it would do maybe in a rat kept on the right. And it, if we had humans that were enriched or conventional, maybe the drug would only work for conventionally housed humans in stressful situations compared to enriched individuals. And we can use the previous figure to discuss how the environment would reduce sleep that could increase stress, but at the same token, factors within the environment are stressful that would be further compounding the problem of reducing sleep. And it's really tricky <laughs> being able to identify which comes first. Is it a reduction in sleep and stress or is it stress that is reducing sleep? So let's have a think about how we can manage the environment um, to enhance welfare and sleep. This diagram by Derhart et al really nicely visualizes some of the things that are there to promote sleep and those that suppress sleep. So your blue arrows, the arrows are indicating sleep promotion. So there can be some forms of sensory stimulation that can promote sleep like massage, um, learning and memory very much linked in with um, an increasing pressure to sleep, sickness where an animal takes itself off to be quiet and convalesce to promote kind of its immune response to enhance its um, recovery rate. We talked about the homeostatic control of sleep, so prior waking time, where you are awake for longer periods of time or increasing durations of time, then the pressure to sleep increases um, and time of day due to that circadian control. Um, and in the same way then, it can also be a uh, suppressor. So you wouldn't necessarily think about sleeping at nine o'clock in the morning, more at nine o'clock at night. And some of those um, suppressing factors Sensory stimulation, loud noise. Um, and we talk about competing priorities, so biologically significant behaviours like predator avoidance, reproduction and um, eating. All of these things generally will override where they occur um, in their motivation to achieve these types of behaviours will over prioritise sleep. So they will suppress um, sleep occurrence where there's opportunity to reproduce or if you have to run away from something or there's an opportunity to eat. And on the right hand side, we'll try and break that down and think about it a little bit in terms of domestic animals. So we can think about sleeping surfaces. Um, you see a lot of cats now have um, special caves that they can go into um, and all kinds of baskets and bits and pieces um, to try and promote different sleeping surfaces um, and provide preference and choice. Um, because of circadian control, artificial light in a domestic environment can massively affect the occurrence of sleep. Um, for example, in um, urban areas where we see um, street lights being left on um, a lot longer, you might start to see um, 
animals that you expect to see out in the daytime only out a little bit longer because of that influential light in their environment. Um, we've also done some research to look at how um, light can affect the occurrence of sleep in horses in stables with some interesting results. Um, and recent research has suggested that actually if you um, keep turning the lights on and off overnight, that can also disturb sleep for stabled horses. Um, sound, novel auditory stimuli can have a massive influence on, on prey species specifically because they are constantly vigilant um, and subject to sympathetic nervous system activation. A foot temperature on here relative to core body temperature. So when we want to sleep, we need to dissipate energy. Um, so we might feel ourselves um, getting hotter and that's us cooling down as we start to um, release heat energy, which is why you need to have a, a bedroom that's really nice and cool to enable that. Um, and we think about that maybe relative to the sleeping surfaces or the home environment in terms of temperature. And for horses, we rug our horses sometimes. I mean, we clip them and muck around with their, their hair. And we talk about the effects that that might have in terms of pilo erection, hair erection to be able to facilitate thermoregulation. There are lots of seasonal conditions that can affect how animals sleep. So if um, we're in the summer and the um, ability to obtain fresh forage is reduced, then maybe you'll spend more time traversing an area to try and find forage as opposed to sleep. Um, there's also flight burden potentially and other weather conditions that might affect how and where you sleep. Social interaction for different species is different. If you're a prey species, it's likely that um, you want to sleep in a group for shared vigilance. Pain and injury has a massive influence on whether animals sleep or not. We talked about sickness, but if an animal is in pain, the likelihood of it achieving a recumbent posture is, is maybe reduced, which will have knock-on effects of whether it can or can't achieve that rapid eye movement sleep. And then at the bottom, there's competing priorities that we've, we've talked about. So I took some um, hints and tips from Sune on how to um, optimize my uh, volume here. And I hope that this video works. Um, so this is a horse at Hartbury. Um, which is where I am. And perhaps I can hear the background noise. And you can see this animal's face is black and low, suggesting that it is in resting condition. It's definitely not a sleep, because there is ear movement. And ear movement suggests that there is somatic muscle activity. And we can also see that it's in response to changes in auditory stimuli in the environment. So we can see that the bottom lip is relaxed, the head is low, but in actual fact the ability to sleep is affected simply by the auditory stimulation in the environment. And with that in mind, Heart free, we've introduced rest periods on the yard now, which means that there is nobody on the yard at any point between, say, 9 and 11 a.m., and then again after 5 p.m., um, and there's a quiet period over lunch to facilitate animals' ability to kind of um, adjust and rest. I'm thinking about the horse and just really thinking about um, quality. We were familiar with the young adult and the elderly adult graphs here, the hypnograms of sleep cycles, but the one at the bottom here is an equine hypnogram. So this is electroencephalography results, sleep stages captured with EEG for a horse. And we can see that within this particular graph, there are multiple points at which the animal is waking. And it's waking from deep sleep and it's also waking from rapid eye movement sleep multiple times across the night. And we were really interested when we saw this, thinking about sleep quality, as we talked about with adults, um, humans, sorry, earlier. If you take the first period of sleep in the first hour, we might say that that's maybe, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes of sleep from start to finish. But if we were to take out, say, three, maybe nine, 10 minutes, because of those periods of wakefulness, we would measure it as 30 to 40 minutes, but actually it would be 20 to 30 minutes. 
So where we're measuring sleep quantity cumulatively, it's inaccurate because we're not taking into account these um, wakeful periods as well. So we put together um, a series of equations um, to enable people to start to measure the occurrence of sleep quality um, and they should be transferable um, between different species um, and they're available in this QR code in the paper on the bottom right hand side here if you're interested. Um, I'm just going to finish on some unusual things about sleep. So let's hope that this video loads. Again, another horse in a stable. But this horse was never seen to lie down, which means that it wasn't achieving rapid eye movement sleep because of the muscle atonia associated with it. Instead, we would see multiple occurrences of this behavior throughout the night, where the horse's head drops quite significantly, and you see some wobbling and swaying. And the horse has managed to kind of prop itself up against the wall here in order to preserve its standing position whilst we think it's achieving some form of rapid eye movement sleep. So we're really keen to have a look at different ways in which animals adapt to achieve some kind of sleep where maybe the environment isn't optimal. And we suggested that this horse's environment wasn't optimal because it had moved to our yard and it was a novel environment that it wasn't particularly familiar with. Yeah. Um, and then I'm also going to finish to think about the interrelationship between abnormal repetitive behavior and sleep. Um, unfortunately, this is definitely limited to horses. Um, I haven't looked at sleep and abnormal repetitive behavior in, in other animals. So bear with me with um, terminology linked to abnormal repetitive behavior in horses. This graph talks about cribbing and weaving. Crib biting is a oral abnormal behavior where the animal normally fixes its incisors onto a surface, draws back and normally makes a loud grunting noise. And it will do that a number of times within a bout. And weaving, you may be familiar with, I think in giraffes um, and elephants, where they will, they will move from left to right foot and you might see some characteristic head swaying that goes along with that as well. And Claire Gattel, we're really interested at how this, uh, how these behaviors um, bore out across the 24 hour period. So you can see that the white circles are cribbing, high frequency of uh, cribbing occurring inside of every hour up until probably nine o'clock in the morning and then increasing again. Whereas weaving behavior, massive jump, around nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. And that's linked in with kind of probably the routine on the yard. Um, so this is thought to be kind of, um, uh, what's the word? An anticipatory behavior. So it's thinking about what's gonna happen and it's getting excited about it. Whereas crib biting is linked in with changes in neural pathways um, and it becomes a habit. So it becomes very much the normal behavioral profile for that animal. And we don't try and prevent these behaviors because um, Crib biting specifically is something that the animal is highly motivated to do. Um, so why am I showing you this? Well, <laughs> crib biting horses engaged in fewer bouts of recumbency than weavers or control horses. So it meant that crib biting horses were laying down um, much less frequently than control horses and weaving horses. And that's probably well, there's a number of reasons why horses wouldn't lie down as we looked at in the management slide. So there's a, a number of reasons why recumbency might be affected, but particularly for cribbing, it's probably because cribbing prioritizes over other behaviors in every single hour. Whereas weaving only prioritizes maybe at, at specific peak points during a 24 hour period. So crib biting is constantly um, competing with other behaviours in the behavioural repertoire and sleep might be one of those things specific where we see reduced recumbency for those. But the finding wasn't discussed by the authors, so there's a lot more opportunity to research that. And I just wanted to highlight that none of the control horses kept on the same yard as the weaving or the crib biting horses. They didn't dis um, uh, develop any of this, the abnormal repetitive behaviours, so it's not copied in any way, shape or form. So. Hopefully that's taken us on a rip-roaring run through what sleep is, 
how it links into welfare, what we can do to promote sleep, um, and some occurrences linked into abnormal behavior thinking about welfare. So it's a, a homeostatic process, which means that animals can be flexible um, and they can adapt, um, but they are still tied to sleep pressure. And so with increasing pressure to sleep, they will um, attempt to engage in that wherever, wherever possible, where there's you no know, competing priorities. Um, sleep and well-being are massively interlinked, but it's very difficult to know which comes first. And as human caregivers, we need to appraise our environments to make sure that it offers the animal with a physical space and that physically enables them to sleep, but also provides them with the agency to achieve sleep. So wherever they need to sleep, whenever they need to sleep, they can. But it's also massively important to know what normal sleep is as well before we make a start on working out what's abnormal um, and what needs to change. So I hope that that's been um, useful. There's some references there um, with thanks to everyone who's contributed. Um, and I think I'll stop sharing my screen now and um, there's some time for some questions, hopefully. Thank you so much, uh, Linda, for that amazing <laughs> presentation. Uh, before I hand over to the moderator to continue with this, I was just wondering, is it, is it uh, unique uh, for horses to sleep while standing or? Yeah, um, I think I think that there are, uh, horses are the only ones that have what we know as passive stay apparatus, which means that they can lock um, their, their, their rear, their hind limbs, um, and uh, certainly within the front limbs as well, that enables them to stand very still. And in that position, they can achieve non-rapid eye movement sleep. But where they try and achieve that rapid eye movement sleep, um, they get a bit wibbly wobbly because they lose their muscle tone. Um, so there's more chance of them falling over. Wow. <laughs> <It's> strange. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so they're not even daydreaming, they're actually sleeping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Victor, please, can you continue with the questions from the chat box? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation, Linda. I've got a couple of questions already here in the chat box. So I'm going to be um, asking you, one first question I'm having here is from Dr. Drew Sharawi. He's asking, what are the probable reasons why horses and cattle sleep less than wolf based on the table you presented? Are there some evolutionary causes for that? Yes, definitely. Um, there's a good table in the review paper that discusses that in a lot of detail. We thought about it um, in terms of something called the sleep exposure index which is where your smaller mammals can hide in holes or hide up trees and have less pressure of predation. Whereas your larger ungulates that can't hide in caves or up trees or in holes or under bushes, they are more seen in their landscape. Um, they have a higher sleep index, uh, sleep predation index, which means that they would sleep less. So yes, definitely very much linked into evolution. There's also things like, um, oh, I'm going to get the, the thing now, the metabolic basal rate, um, the amount of energy that they're producing in terms of how much they need to eat. So competing pressures there. And we also talked about um, gestation periods as well. So animals that are precocial when they're born, the following kind of animals, they have a longer gestation period, which means that their brain is better developed when they are born, but then they achieve less sleep as, as a result because they're up and moving immediately. So yes, there's lots of different reasons why. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, so I was just wondering myself, to, like, is there any correlation between sleep duration and then That's the size of, brain rate of animals? Um, I, there is a correlation there definitely um, linked into brain size, but off the top of my head, I wouldn't be able to tell you um, what that was, but the horse features low there because it's got a big body and a small brain relatively. <laughs> so, well. okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I have a question here from Jackie who is asking, um, as science identified, if in science, um, is there any particular, okay, let me, as the science ad identified if animals in particular or sleep walk, maybe looking for feed if they are hungry when they are dropped off to sleep? 
Yeah, this is um, this is a brilliant one. I haven't heard of any examples of animals sleepwalking. I'm keen to hear about them, but I haven't. What I have seen is animals, um, what we would, uh, as a lay public, probably describe as dreaming. So if you've watched maybe a dog and you see its legs running and it's woof, 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 woof in its sleep, <laughs> and horses do the same, we go, oh, look, it's doing a dressage test or running the Grand National. We get all kinds of um, movement occurring and it's not voluntary muscle movement, it's not conscious muscle movement, um, but there is a condition in humans called sleep behavior disorder. So you may also be aware of people that um, are described as maybe playing football during their sleep or they lash out during their sleep, those types of behavior. And they are linked to specific conditions in humans. And I wonder if the behavior that we're seeing in our animals is also indicative of the conditions that are similar to humans as well. So I'm keen to hear any stories of, of sleepwalking animals, but um, the rest of the, the sleep dis behavior disorder is um, is at the top of my list for investigation at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much for that great answer. Um, Dr. Drew Sherry is asking again, if you've talked about the differences in stages of sleep from one to three, maybe. Okay, yeah. Um, so it's all to do with the different types of brainwave activity. So I, I haven't, all of my research is around behavior. So I observe behavioral states and infer sleep states from those. Um, and we have drawn that from um, research that has used electroencephalography and provided behavioral data for us to be able to infer that from. But my knowledge of electroencephalography is linked into the different types of um, brainwave activity um, indicating how much deeper an, an individual is moving into sleep. So stage one is quite light, stage three and or four is is really, really deep. Um, and you can see the differences in the, the um, EEG output to indicate what activity is going on um, correlated with that. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Yanela is just saying such an interesting and informative focus and outlook in animal welfare. She's like appreciating you on that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I have another question here from um, Dr. Drew Shara again. Do you have any information if breed differences exist for sleeping behavior in horses? Yes. Um, specifically, there is evidence of narcolepsy in miniature horse breeds. So I don't know if you guys are um, familiar with Falabellas. They are a horse, but they've been bred to be tiny, <laughs> as opposed to a pony, which is completely different again. Um, and it's in, only in those miniature horse breeds that we see narcolepsy. There's no other, it's because it's a genetically underpinned condition. We don't see that type of behavior or genetic um, signature in, in horses and ponies other than the miniature ones. Breed-wise, um, I think it will probably come back to environment more than than breed because there are maybe minor differences in genetics between breeds but it's quite a wide pool really so you wouldn't expect genetics to play too much of a part in sleep behavior saying that in humans there are elite sleepers so those people that can last a whole day on just four hours of sleep they are genetically different so they have a, a way to be able to have more intense sleep during slow wave sleep. Um, and we wonder if those types of horses might exist as well. But I think that that's not immediate priority research because <laughs> that's going to cost some time and money. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that great answer. Um, I have a question on dreaming here. Yeah? Like, um, is that evidence of animals being um, capable of dreaming just like we humans do? And yeah. then does that contribute to animal welfare if there's any? Good, good question. I think that links back into what we were talking about with that sleep behavior disorder. So because animals can achieve rapid eye movement sleep, and that's when we are most likely to dream, we might suggest that animals do experience dreams. But because they can't verbalize their experiences of sleep, I don't know if we'll ever be able to understand dream states in animals. Um, and I don't know for my welfare whether dreams are good or bad either. <laughs> Some of mine are weird. 
can I just uh, pinch on that? You know, there are some humans that snore. They snore. Yes. So do we have things like that in animals? Yeah. Yes, I very much enjoy how lots of my friends now have CCTV equipment and they share the footage of their animals oh. on social media. Yeah, yeah. And someone's just recently bought a new horse and she's very proudly showing him off on social media because he's lovely. Um, but he snores. He snores like an elephant. You have never heard an animal <laughs> snore so loudly in your life. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking about how uh, sleep apnea is linked in with sleep quality, how you can be woken up because of irregularities in your breathing. That's linked through to conditions um, such as uh, linked to weight, for example. I'm really interested to understand sleep quality alongside that breathing and respiratory rate measurement. And that's something that we are looking at in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have you exhausted the questions, Victor? Um, thank you very much, Linda. I think I don't have any more questions in the chat box. Just um, um, a quick one from Jacko. Yeah, excellent overview. Clearly, extremely knowledgeable and well informed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much, Victor, for moderating. And uh, I have a question. I realized in one of the uh, papers you presented, the figures, there was no stage four sleep in the horses. So I was wondering why there was no stage four. Ah, uh, yes. So that's um, an interesting, at the moment, I think in the human literature, they're saying that three stages three and four are actually the same thing because it's del delta wave profiles. I'm not privy to that massive discussion, um, but I, I do know that they haven't been able to detect stage four in horses. So we think that the deepest stage horses in is stage three. Okay, so thank you so much. And I think we'll just manage to have a five minutes interaction. So uh, if you have any comments or further questions for the presenter before she leaves, kindly uh, indicate using the reaction button. Feel free to turn on your videos and let's see ourselves and we are sure we are not talking to, <laughs> to robots. <laughs> And I, I'm, so that I'm also sure that you're actively, you know, involved in this piece. We'll be happy to have you turn on your video. And if you have further comments for the presenter, please use the reaction button and then I will unmute you, please. We want this to be as interactive as possible. In the next five minutes, we'll round up. So, um, Christina Anderson says, Thank you for an amazing presenter, presentation, very informative and has given me a lot to think about. Wow, that's great. <laughs> Thank you for the feedback. Yeah, I want to appreciate you, Linda, for taking time to share your knowledge and your expertise in this area uh, with us. Actually, uh, sleeping is an aspect that I've done quite a little bit on in chickens and we're still yet to revisit it and do it more, you know, in detail. So. And I think, uh, you know, I think when we begin to understand what animals are doing or what quantity of time probably they need to sleep, then it will also uh, enhance their welfare and it will not be like we are encroaching into their, probably their quiet time or things like that, so that we give them the amount, the amount enough amount of time for them to sleep. So I want to appreciate everybody. They uh, have a have a wonderful day wherever you are and bye for now. <laughs>